Hello friends and welcome to this channel. Hyponatremia is a very common electrolyte abnormality seen in clinical practice, yet it is confusing how to approach it. In this video, we have tried to make it easy to understand and apply the knowledge in clinical practice. Let's dive in. Hyponatremia is said to be present when serum sodium is less than 135 millimole per liter. Pathophysiology and Causes From physiology basics, we know that sodium is the major extracellular cation. Changes in serum sodium is always accompanied by alteration in water and thus volume status. Since sodium is extracellular cation, so by volume status we mean mainly extracellular volume. When we encounter hyponatremia, fundamentally, there is greater retention of water relative to sodium and the resultant serum osmolality will be low. Many causes can lead to hyponatremia. And a patient can have multiple causes at the same time. To make things easy, causes of hyponatremia are best categorized according to extracellular fluid or ECF volume status. There are three possible volume statuses. Hypovolemia, euvolemia, or hypervolemia. And the patient with hyponatremia will have at least one of these three status. This is obvious, but patient can have more than one status as well. For example, a hypervolemic patient due to congestive heart failure can become hypovolemic due to fluid losses through diuretic use or diarrhea, for example. Anyway, whatever is the volume status of a patient, hyponatremia has occurred because there is more water relative to the sodium. And every volume status will indicate towards some specific causes, and determining volume status will help us narrow down the differential of hyponatremia. But before proceeding to group the causes according to volume status, it is pertinent to note that sometimes you may get hyponatremia in test results, despite the patient actually having a normal sodium level. This may occur either due to increased patient's serum osmolality or may occur due to lab artifacts. Increased serum osmolality or hypertonicity causes an osmotic shift of water from interstitial and intracellular space to intravascular space leading to a relative increase in water to sodium. This situation may be seen in severe hyperglycemia or with the use of an osmotically active substance, such as mannitol. Artifactual causes of hyponatremia, on the other hand, include severe hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia. Here the aqueous fraction of the serum sample is reduced because of the volume occupied by the macromolecules. This artifact is seen only with the use of certain type of assays. Since there is no actual change in water or sodium status in this situation, this type of hyponatremia is called pseudohyponatremia. In this case, serum osmolality will be normal or isotonic. So after getting hyponatremia into the lab result, we shall first check whether hyponatremia is actually due to low sodium or the result of the aforementioned phenomenon. Therefore, estimate the serum osmolality by using this equation. Serum osmolality is equal to 2 times sodium concentration, plus glucose plus urea. Both glucose and urea must be in millimole per liter. To convert values from milligram per deciliter to millimole per liter, divide the value of glucose by 18 and that of urea by 2.8. Normal serum osmolality ranges between 275 to 295 milliosmoles per kg. If osmolality is less than 275 milliosmoles per kg, hyponatremia is true and is not the result of lab artifacts or hyperosmolality. Now that it has been established the hyponatremia we are dealing with is true hyponatremia, let's go back to volume status that we were discussing. So where were we? Yes, assess the volume status of the patient and see whether the patient is hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic. If the patient is hypovolemic, there is depletion of sodium and water, but the sodium deficit exceeds the water deficit, causing hypovolemia and hyponatremia. The second situation is if the patient is hypervolemic or in volume overload. In this situation, 
excessive water retention has occurred due to sodium retention and there is volume expansion. And lastly, the patient volume status is normal. In this situation, there are no major disturbances of body sodium content and the patient is clinically uvolemic. Now let's see in group causes in each situation. Hypovolemic hyponatremia is seen in situations with fluid losses such as GI losses due to vomiting, diarrhea, or third spacing of fluids. Next, the use of diuretics, especially thiazide. Burns, cerebral salt wasting and sodium losing nephropathy, and last but not the least, volume contraction, as seen in adrenocortical insufficiency. You will find symptoms and signs of hypovolemia in this category, and the cause of sodium loss is usually apparent. Symptoms include thirst, dizziness on standing, and weakness. Signs you may find include tachycardia, postural hypotension, prolonged capillary refill time, dry mouth, reduced skin turgor, reduced urine output, weight loss, delirium, and stupor. Hypervolemic hyponatremia is seen in conditions leading to fluid overload including heart failure, liver cirrhosis, or nephrotic syndrome. And the cause of hyponatremia is usually obvious from the history and clinical condition of the patient. Next, coming to uvolemic hyponatremia. Here sodium itself is in normal quantity, but for some reason, there is excess water. Excess body water may be the result of abnormally high intake either orally or as a result of medically infused fluids. Primary polydipsia is the term given to excessive drinking of water, and most of the time, it has a psychogenic reason. And iatrogenic excess water is seen when excessive intravenous dextrose is given or in post-prostatectomy patients whose bladder is irrigated and there is the absorption of sodium-free bladder irrigation fluid. Water retention also occurs in the syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone, or vasopressin. In this condition, an endogenous source of vasopressin, either cerebral or tumor-derived, promotes water retention by the kidney in the absence of an appropriate physiological stimulus. Uvolemic hyponatremia is also seen in hypothyroidism, with pure glucocorticoid deficiency. Then people on tea and toast diet, where there is less solute intake. And beer potomania, where a patient is drinking excessive beer, take no regular diet, and is therefore deficient in getting enough solutes. Coming to clinical features of hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is often asymptomatic, but may be associated with profound disturbances of cerebral function. The symptoms of hyponatremia depend on the speed at which it develops and its severity. As we will discuss now that symptoms are more related to the speed at which it develops than the severity of hyponatremia. Normally intracellular and extracellular osmolality stays equal, allowing free movement of water in both directions, with no net increase in a single direction. But, when hyponatremia develops acutely, plasma osmolality falls. In this situation, cells have no time to adjust to this difference in intercompartmental osmolality. As a result, water rapidly flows into cerebral cells, causing them to swell and ischemic. However, if hyponatremia develops gradually, cerebral neurons have time to respond by reducing intracellular osmolality through excreting potassium and reducing the synthesis of intracellular organic osmolites. Now, the osmotic gradient between two compartments is reduced and therefore there is no intracellular shift of water. This process takes about 24 to 48 hours. Therefore, hyponatremia is classified as acute if it develops in less than 48 hours and chronic if it develops in more than 48 hours. Based on biochemical findings or the degree of severity of symptoms, hyponatremia can also be defined as mild, moderate, and severe. Mild hyponatremia when serum sodium is 130 to 135 millimol per liter. Moderate, when serum sodium is 125 to 129, and severe when serum sodium is less than 125 millimol per liter. Mild hyponatremia may not have any symptoms, moderate may present with nausea, 
headache and delirium, while severe hyponatremia with vomiting, somnolence, seizures, coma, and cardiorespiratory arrest. Now, the diagnostic approach. Let's see how to approach hyponatremia clinically. Few simple steps, and you will be able to arrive at the cause of hyponatremia. First, calculate osmolality and establish that you are dealing with true hyponatremia. Then check the volume status of the patient. Place the patient in one of the three groups that we've mentioned before and see if clinically you can make out the cause of hyponatremia. Then, do urinary sodium and additionally in uvolemic hyponatremia, do urine osmolality. Now let's further narrow down the differential. If urinary sodium is greater than 30 millimoles per liter, it means that the kidneys are not conserving sodium, rather the cause of hyponatremia is renal. So focus on the renal causes in that group and explore accordingly. On the other hand, if urinary sodium is less than 30 millimoles per liter, it implies kidneys are functioning to conserve sodium, and the cause of hyponatremia is extrarenal. So focus on extrarenal causes from that list. In the uvolemic group, see if urine osmolality is less than 100 milliosmoles per kg, the cause is primary polydipsia or iatrogenic water overload because ADH secretion is inhibited and urine is maximally diluted. The other condition is reset osmostat. Reset osmostat is one of the subtypes of SIADH and we'll discuss in a video on SIADH. On the other hand, if urine osmolality is more than 100 milliasmoles per kg, then consider other causes in the list of uvolemic group. Now the management. Treatment of hyponatremia includes correction of hyponatremia itself and treatment of the underlying cause that has led to hyponatremia. Correction of hyponatremia. The treatment of hyponatremia is critically dependent on its rate of development, severity, presence of symptoms, and underlying cause. If hyponatremia has developed rapidly in less than 48 hours and there are signs of cerebral edema, such as obtundation or convulsions, sodium levels should be restored rapidly to normal. This is achieved by infusion of 3% hypertonic saline. A common approach is to give an initial bolus of 150 milliliters over 20 minutes, which may be repeated once or twice, depending on the neurological response and rise in plasma sodium. On the other hand, rapid correction of chronic hyponatremia can be hazardous. This is because brain cells have adapted to extracellular hypoosmolality by reducing the intracellular osmolality and thus maintaining normal cell volume. Under these conditions, an abrupt increase in extracellular osmolality will not give sufficient time to brain cells to adapt to new osmolality. This will lead to water shifting out of neurons, abruptly reducing their volume and causing them to detach from their myelin sheaths. The resulting myelinolysis can produce permanent structural and functional damage to midbrain structures and is generally fatal. The rate of correction of the plasma sodium concentration in chronic asymptomatic hyponatremia, therefore, should not exceed 10 millimoles per liter per 24 hours, and an even slower rate is generally safer. The underlying cause should also be treated. For hypovolemic patients, this involves controlling the source of sodium loss, for example vomiting, or stopping diuretic, and administering intravenous saline if clinically warranted like patient with burns or diarrhea, etc. Patients with uvolemic hyponatremia generally respond to fluid restriction in the range of 600 to 1000 milliliters per 24 hours. In cases of SIADH, where possible, withdraw the precipitating stimulus such as drugs causing SIADH. In patients with persistent hyponatremia due to prolonged SIADH, oral urea therapy can be used, which provides a solute load to promote water excretion. Oral vasopressin receptor antagonists, such as talvaptin may also be used, but concerns exist about the risk of overly rapid correction of hyponatremia with these agents. Hypervolemic patients with hyponatremia need treatment of the underlying condition, 
accompanied by the cautious use of diuretics in conjunction with strict fluid restriction. Potassium-sparing diuretics may be particularly useful in this context when there is significant secondary hyperaldosteronism. And this is it for this video. We hope you found this lecture useful. If so, help this channel grow by subscribing to it, like this video, and share with other colleagues as well. See you in the next video. Bye for now.